Hello and welcome to this 11th episode of Season 7 of The Dark Money Files, in which we shine a light into a murky world. I am Ray Blake and with me is my co-host, friend and business partner Graham Barrow. Hello Graham. Hello Ray. Graham, I don't know if you get many letters these days. Um, mostly emails to be honest, but occasionally a letter as well, yep. And I'm guessing that these letters will mostly be official ones and will arrive in window envelopes. That is exactly right, Ray. It seems that an ever-shrinking group of organisations are actually writing letters on a routine basis. But among those who continue in this practice, we can include regulators. Well, I think there's a certain legal side to this that's best addressed through the tried and tested method of writing on paper delivered by the postal system. Indeed, Graham. The FCA, for instance, writes to individual firms it's supervising in the course of the authorisation and supervision processes, but occasionally they send out a blanket letter to a whole group of firms. You know, when most companies do that, Ray, it's called junk mail, isn't it? Uh, Yes, and it usually goes straight in the bin. But that's perhaps not how you'd want to treat a letter from the regulator, even one that's more of a circular than personal correspondence. And I think that's a fair point, Ray. Mm. And today I thought we could devote some attention to just such a letter from the regulator that went to all CEOs of retail banks in the spring. Well, do you know, I think I know the one you mean. Is that why we are interrupting our series on alternative laundries, right? Uh, Yes, Graham. Uh, The letter is important and time sensitive. So it seems right that this episode should go out while it's still highly relevant. Well, I completely agree. And I should also say that the FCA letter reminded me very much of one that the Central Bank of Ireland issued at the end of last year. Yes, you're right. Uh, That one caused a a few ripples because unlike the normal Dear CEO approach where a particular issue is highlighted, that one from the Central Bank of Ireland basically said, look, this doesn't seem to be working. We're finding really basic failings in your firms and you need to up your game. Yes, and, and you know, while we're going to talk about that letter and the letter from the FCA, I just think it's worth saying at this point that it's very unlikely there's anywhere much in the world that doesn't also fall within the same kind of observations of its local regulators. Uh, I think that's a fair comment, Graham. So um, it had a certain flavour to it and it wasn't a good one. Uh, No, I think that's right, Graham. And and, and it's that same flavour that I see echoed in this new letter from the FCA, too. So it's pretty serious, then? Oh, I'd say so, yes. Uh, And unlike the Central Bank of Ireland's letter, the FCA's one requires firms to conduct an analysis off the back of it, and it sets a deadline, too. So... Clearly, that's worth having a bit of a look at. Let's rewind Mm. a bit, Ray. When did this letter arrive in the CEO's in-trays? Well, it was dated the 21st of May and sent to retail banks on the 22nd of May of 2021. But only to retail banks? Yep, that's the case. So how do we know about it? Have we got a leaked copy or something? It was shared quite widely early on, including by the FCA, who published it on their own site at the uh, at the end of June. Ah, so it's legitimate for us to be talking about it then. Oh, yes. Good. Um, mm. Now, that letter has quite an uncompromising heading, doesn't it? And I'm going to quote mm. word for word. It says, Action needed in response to common control failings identified in anti-money laundering frameworks. Doesn't beat about the bush, does it? No, and frankly, neither does the letter itself. It Mm. briefly states that it will share themes coming out of recent assessments and expresses disappointment that common weaknesses are still being seen regularly. Just like the Irish letter, then? Yes. Um, Would you like to hear what those common areas are? Uh, Well, go on, then. Well, they are, quote... 
Governance and oversight, risk assessments, due diligence, transaction monitoring and suspicious activity reporting. Mm, That doesn't leave much that there aren't issues with, to be honest, does it? I think that's a fair observation, Ray. Mm. The letter goes on to stress the importance of the retail banking sector and the consequences of poor financial crime controls. It also points out the commercial risks to firms found wanting, like enforcement action and business restrictions. Out, uh, yes. As well as, of course, the requirement we often see of firms having to appoint a skilled person to carry out a detailed review. Mm. And I see it adds in bold text, quotes, in the supervisory work we conduct, we will continue to consider carefully whether the relevant senior management function holders have carried out their responsibilities appropriately. Yep, they are definitely pinning this on the senior managements. Hmm. What does the FCA say that firms need to do in response to the letter? There's some very prescriptive action required, Graham. CEOs are to consider carefully the letter and take necessary steps to gain assurance that their own arrangements are in order and reflect their firm's risks and the legal requirements. Um, something they should be doing already, Ray? Uh, Well, indeed, Graham, but the tenor of this letter is that more has to be done. And I understand there is a specific deadline for this exercise, isn't there? Uh, Yes, there is. CEOs are expected to complete a gap analysis against each of the common weaknesses outlined by the 17th of September 2021, and then take prompt and reasonable steps to close any gaps identified. And then there's an assertion that senior managers holding the financial crime function should have sufficient seniority to get this done and that the FCA will be asking firms when visiting in the future to demonstrate steps they've taken in response to this letter. This feels very serious, Graham. I think it is, Ray. And although it's expressed politely, these are strong words from the regulator. There's an annex to the letter, too, where the FCA outlines in a little more detail the particularly common weaknesses it wants firms to look at. Should we run through that? Oh, yes, let's. Um, I recall the first area was governance and oversight. It was, Graham, and under that heading there are several threads. Uh, The first is about the three lines of defence, and the complaint here is that too often there's a blurring between the first and second lines. Uh, In what way, Ray? There's an example offered in which the compliance department completes due diligence and risk assessments. Oh, yeah, now that is problematic because it means there is no ownership of the risks in the first line and that compliance can't then effectively conduct independent oversight. Yeah, uh, and those are exactly the points made in the letter annex, Graham. Hmm, yes. OK, so what else is there? Well, there's a piece on the ownership of key controls. Essentially, the issue described is where the senior management can't demonstrate a proper level of ownership and oversight because the controls are formulated or operated or tested elsewhere, by an overseas head office, for instance, or by an outsourced function. And we've seen these issues so many times, Ray, haven't we? We have. And the regulator has no truck with the head office looks after all this argument. I heard that one as well. Mm. Um, And I see they also raise another familiar failing, which is about the visibility of decisions and sign-off. Yeah, as well as the recorded rationale for risk decisions, whether those are escalated to senior management or handled in the first line. OK, so that's governance and oversight. And next we have risk assessment. And the annex makes clear that they mean both the business-wide risk assessment and the customer risk assessment. Yep. Yeah, it's both of those, Graham. Now, we see a lot of business-wide risk assessments, right? Both good and bad. Uh, mostly bad, I'm afraid. <laughs> I think that's right. Um, what specific issues does the regulator raise here? Well, they cite insufficient detail on the risks the business faces, inadequate evidence for the effectiveness of mitigating controls, and they also talk about those conducted at a head office level, where the particular exposures of the UK branch or subsidiary aren't properly explored. 
Now, this is becoming a theme in itself, isn't it? Mm. The the UK operation has to meet the UK requirements, irrespective of wider group obligations. Yeah, absolutely. And and where the UK management reports to a group level elsewhere, the FCA expects the UK management to ensure UK compliance, irrespective of company hierarchy. <laughs> I'm rather sure that occasions some difficult conversations in global firms. Well, we know it does, Graham. We've had some of them ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quite so. Now, what about the other part of risk assessment then, the one at the customer level? Well, there are three key issues cited here, Graham. The first is the overly generic nature of assessments. Yeah, now the annex talks about the different exposures between money laundering and terrorism financing or between correspondent banking and trade finance. And here I can see their point, but if you have a customer undertaking both of those activities, there are problems, aren't there, Graham, in treating them as high risk for one product and low risk for another? Yes, but there are also problems in not properly accounting for the different exposures between Mm. different services and products. Basically, an overly generic approach isn't going to satisfy the regulators here. A fair point. They also criticise the way risk ratings are, or perhaps aren't, documented and justified. And finally, Ray, there's a complaint that firms focus on money laundering and sanctions risks and overlook other financial crime risks like tax evasion and bribery and corruption. And here is where your business-wide risk assessment is so useful. If you get that right, it makes the customer risk assessment methodology much more appropriate, doesn't it? Wise words, Ray. So... What's next in the list? Due diligence, Graham. And there are points here labelled as CDD and EDD. And at the heart of CDD for all customers is that you understand and document the nature and purpose of the relationship and that you compare the client activity that you see against this baseline and investigate any divergence from that expectation. Yep, that's CDD in a nutshell, I think, Graham. Okay, so what does the FCA say banks need to work harder on within that spectrum? Uh, All of that, Graham. (laughs) All of it? Yep, they cite observed problems with all of that. Well, okay. Well, I hesitate to ask my next question, but what about EDD? Well, actually, it's a bit more nuanced here, uh, other than the general point that some banks have what it calls a weak approach to EDD, that doesn't always mitigate the actual risks posed by the customer. Yeah, and I believe there is a reference to source of funds and source of wealth. Uh, Yes, Graham. Firstly, that these aren't adequately assessed where PEPs are concerned, which is a worry. Uh, Mm. And secondly, that the two are confused with one another and firms often obtain the same evidence in support of both. Well, I can't believe that, right? (laughs) Um, But of course, that's never going to work, is it? That that they are two very distinct concepts and need to be evidenced with different documents entirely. Oh, yeah. And furthermore, the FCA says there's little evidence of firms taking a risk-based approach to source of funds and source of wealth, where the origins of the customer's monies are a key risk. Yeah, because there is a small set of circumstances where there's a legal obligation to satisfy yourselves on source of funds and source of wealth, Mm. but a rather bigger set of cases where you'd really want to do so in response to specific heightened risks. Indeed. But the FCA say this isn't happening enough. Furthermore, they end by saying that, and here I'm quoting, firms must ensure that they apply EDD measures in all high-risk situations and can clearly evidence what work has been undertaken. Well, that's a very clear direction, isn't it? I'd have said so. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Graham, if I asked you what mistakes firms often make with their transaction monitoring, what would you say? Well, from, from working with firms on this very issue, I'd say that Often there is a reliance on off-the-shelf settings rather than ones tailored to the firm's particular risks, as detailed, of course, in its business-wide risk assessment. And yes, that gets a mention in the letters annex. Tick. 
Uh, they also know that firms find it hard to demonstrate how their arbitrary thresholds relate to expected behaviour of clients or cohorts of clients. And that makes complete sense. Mm. Then there's the way that firms document their rationale for discounting alerts, or sometimes don't document it, um, and that they don't do sufficient checking of what caused the alert against the customer's profile. Uh, tick and tick again. Mm. Then there's the governance. Are the people who oversee the system looking closely enough at its operation and effectiveness? Uh, another tick for Graham. Um, the Annex cites a common lack of understanding of the setup and specifically the integrity of data feeds and systems. It talks about the consequences, potentially, whole business lines, products or customers being excluded from monitoring an error. Well, we've seen that happen, right, haven't we? <laughs> well, we have, sadly, Graham, yeah. <sighs> OK, so so what did I miss? Well, just one aspect, Graham, and this builds on an earlier theme. It's that when the transaction monitoring systems are under the control of a non-UK head office, there might not be sufficient allowance for specific risks in the UK business. Oh, yeah, I've seen that. Um, and, and we're back to that theme again. Uh, we are, we are. The FCA recognises the reality of this, um, but it says that firms should either tailor the system appropriately for UK use or put in place in the UK supplementary risk-based transaction monitoring measures where that's the case. And that seems entirely reasonable. Yes, but not sufficiently common, evidently. <sighs> Um, OK, so if I remember correctly then, we've just arrived at the final area. Yeah, and that is suspicious activity reports. OK, so what's the problem here then? Well, two main issues, Graham. The first is where internal processes for raising and investigating suspicions are unclear or not fully documented or not well understood by staff. Well, that's a worry. Uh, it is, Graham, and according to the FCA, they often find examples of this. Oh dear. Mm. Um, and the second issue? Firms are often unable to demonstrate adequately their investigation, decision-making process and rationale for reporting or not reporting to the NCA. Again, that is not great, is it? It really isn't. And if I'm being honest, Ray, and, and you know I like to be <laughs> honest, I'm feeling quite a bit dispirited by all of this. Well, me too, Graham. Um, but recognising the problem is a necessary step towards fixing it, and the FCA seems determined that it will be fixed. Yeah, now remind me what the retail bank CEOs are required to do. Well, Graham, in response to the letter, they're expected to complete a gap analysis against each of the common weaknesses outlined. Uh, and that's the list of weaknesses we gave earlier, mm. isn't it, Ray? So to remind everyone, that's governance and oversight, risk assessments, and that's both business-wide and at the customer level, due diligence, and again, that's both CDD and EDD, transaction monitoring and suspicious activity reporting. Yep, and they have to complete that gap analysis by the 17th of September 2021 and then take prompt and reasonable steps to close any gaps identified. Now, potentially, Ray, that could be quite a big project, couldn't it? Mm, yeah, it could be. Uh, and while it needs to address only the UK business, the global banks might find it hard to separate that out of the global picture. So there might need to be phases to the project. And to be honest, there isn't too long to get it done now. Well, no, there really isn't. Um, do we have thoughts on what the banks should be doing? Well, I think we can read between the lines of the letter and suggest some guidance. Uh, for instance, the letter fairly squarely calls out the SMF holders as responsible. So I think the analysis should be at least commissioned and overseen at that senior management function level. And, and Ray, I think that's an extremely good idea. Um, I was struck too by the audience for this letter. It is CEOs of retail banks only, isn't it? Uh, yes, Graham, it is. Now, it occurs to me that quite a large proportion of this population of firms will have been through at least one major regulatory remediation exercise in the past. Yes, I'd say that's the case. 
So there's a suggestion here that the regulator understands that past remediations and reviews have not put things right. Mm. So it might be worthwhile CEOs in this analysis reflecting on why not. So were there lessons learned exercises undertaken at the end of past remediations and reviews that, that should be reviewed now in the, in the light of, of this task? If the managers and leaders of those past exercises are still in the business, can they be engaged again and their contributions sought? All good ideas, Ray, and this would add a bit of substance to the analysis. Bear in mind, though, that it's the gap analysis that has a clock ticking. Remedial action doesn't. Yes, so it would be best not to get distracted in the early stages by fixing things and, and risk missing the deadline as a result. Absolutely. The FCA says the firm's steps to close the gaps should be reasonable and prompt, but there's no fixed deadline for that part. OK, so I think the only additional guidance I'd give is to make sure the steps you take to produce the analysis should be really well documented, given that the letter says the FCA will be asking firms to demonstrate what they have done. As ever, Graham, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. Mm. And it is also worth pointing out that we're recording this episode shortly after Monzo has disclosed it is under investigation by the FCA in relation to its AML controls. And the outcome could have, and I'm quoting them, a material negative impact on our financial situation. I don't think this is entirely unrelated to the CEO letter, Graham. I mean, clearly this investigation was underway prior to the letter being sent. Yes, and may just have been one of the prompts to send it. Although from the tone of the dear CEO letter, I'd say one of many. I think you're absolutely right, Ray, and that seems a good note to end on. As you say, Graham. Uh, what's next then? Well, I think we're going to pick up on our alternative laundry series with an episode on art, auctions, sanctions and shell companies. And rather unexpectedly, it's turned into a jaw-dropping expose of some entirely unexpected connections. As is so often the case. Um, an eye for one and looking forward to it.